Welcome back to another 2D to 3D video. I am Folygon, and in this video, I'm going to show you my entire digital character sculpting process from beginning to end. Click that subscribe button if you're new around here and check out the Gumroad link below for courses, tutorials, and my custom brushes. If you wanna learn how I do everything in this video, check out the Appeal Academy. Here is some of my students' work that have gone through the program. A huge congratulations to everyone that participated in this year's Sculptober. If you'd like to see more artwork from the challenge, check out at Sculptober Official on Instagram. And hey, it's spooky season, so that means I need to carve myself out a pumpkin. But not just any old gourd, we're talking about a pumpkin wizard based on the fabulous 2D art of Connie Amandine at Connie.art on Instagram. I'll be turning this 2D concept into 3D using ZBrush, created here on my Cintiq tablet that lets me digitally sculpt my characters starting from a simple sphere. Initially here, I'm using something called Radial Symmetry, which is a really cool tool that saves us a lot of time. It's exactly what it sounds like. It allows me to create forms symmetrically, radially around an object. In this case, a pumpkin. After I'm done creating that super basic form, it's time for me to use something called Live Booleans. You can see the toggle for that turned on in the top left hand corner of the screen, and I'm inserting simple 3D primitives to subtract from the form of my pumpkin. And this is how I'm going to go about the early process of carving the eyes, nose, and mouth. And by using low resolution or low poly geometry, I'm able to create some really nice jagged forms as you can see there for the mouth, Although with the shape and you know roundness of those different edges and bevels on the pumpkin, it's making some of that work a little awkwardly. So I do have to spend some time making sure that that looks really nice. And of course, accurate to our concept. From there, it's time to stretch out a couple more spheres as you guys know I love to do for almost everything that I'm blocking out in the early stage of the process. I use this to create a quick neck and body, as you can see, as well as stretch out the basic position for the legs and arms. Also throwing on some quick paint to those objects to start separating out some of these different areas to distinguish them proportionally from one another. Getting paint on your character early is a fantastic way to check proportions and also get things to start feeling more like the finished character in the early stages of development. For the hat, it is a simple cylinder with a couple extrusions, a little bit of taper, and voila, you got yourself a witch or wizard hat, not too complicated there. During the early stage of block out, most primitive shapes are pretty simple, and I like to poly model or use the Z modeler brush here in ZBrush to keep some of that as simple as possible. I'm a really big fan of repurposing as much of your old stuff as you can. Uh, of course, if your goal is practice, then maybe create every single thing from scratch, but that's exactly what I did here with this hand. I'm repurposing that from another character that I've created in the past so that I can speed up my workflow and start to get him holding that wand and get towards a more finished character a little faster. Of course, hands, very complicated, so I will be going back in on that hand and doing a lot more work on it later to get it to a more finished result, as well as get some of that nice wooden texture on there. Folds are always a ton of fun to sculpt. It's actually the uh, most recent tutorial that I'm creating right now for my Patreon. There's a link down below if you guys want to check it out, as well as get access to all of the other great tutorials available on my Patreon, included all for the same cost. If you want the most updated list on what's available, check out the front page of my Patreon. For this initial process of sculpting, I love using exaggerated, sharp forms to pull out and pinch and just create some messiness to my organic forms as I'm trying to get the general flow and direction of these big poofy sleeves. This is the part of the process that I consider to be refinement when I'm taking all of these blocked out primary forms that look rough 
nasty and sometimes a little alien as I always love to say and starting to refine those make them feel a little more organic if they need to or a little more um, inorganic something like clothing or our backpack here which was a ton of fun to work on. Luckily Connie had some additional reference for me that I could use to get the backside of this backpack, get everything nice and as accurate by lining up the image with my sculpt here as I went, as well as getting on those little stickers and pins and all the zippers, bags, handles, etc. There's a lot going on with this backpack. Actually, in general, there's a lot going on with this character I should say. But here is a really nice small subsection of that as there are all these little parts interacting and working together. Just to create that little bag on the side is a few different pieces of geometry. I think the main bag here in total has over 20 pieces of geometry by the time I'm finished with it. So a lot of different things going on here to create this cohesive feel for this finished bag. Oh, and of course, roughing up some of the form to make sure that it's not all nice and pristine. After I'm done creating the backpack, it's time to get it into position, make sure everything's feeling good, and not just from the front view, right? I am a 3D artist, so I gotta make sure that the balance weight and everything's looking good from the side and back and everything else. I'm going to be honest, I had a moment of weakness with these shoes where for a brief second I thought to myself, you know, I have some pretty similar shoes to these that I have made uh, in the past and I could just repurpose those and, and no, 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 no. I'm going to do it from scratch. I'm going to make some new shoes. I haven't done a shoe in a little while and, and it's always good to practice, right? So I made them from scratch, I spent some time doing this. Uh, as you can see there, I pulled in some reference from some real world shoes. If you are creating any kind of clothing or accessory, I highly recommend do some online shopping, find yourself some additional reference. It can be a lifesaver when you're trying to create something in 3D and don't have a whole lot to go off of like a single image as I do here. Much like the backpack, these shoes have quite a lot going on, a lot of parts and pieces interacting together to create a solid whole, but if you take a look at each individual part by itself, it's really not all that complicated. It's just a matter of slowly building it up one step at a time. And after I'm done creating that orthographically, it's nice to have that in the world axis as I work so I can snap my camera and everything. I can get that into position, put that on the foot, and start working on some folds for our pants. As much fun as it was to create those big billowy folds for the jacket sleeves, I actually enjoyed working on these pants a lot more. Uh, some of the sharper pinched forms around the ankles and backside of the knee were a lot of fun to create. I'm a big fan of sharp, soft shapes. If you've seen any of my work before, then you probably know what I'm talking about. If you don't, they're right here on screen. These are some of my favorite forms to create. Uh, I can just kind of get in and be a little messy, kind of work organically, and you know, whatever happens, happens. You can see I've even thrown in some random texture onto the pants to help make those feel a little more organic. And then I finish everything up there with some quick seams. Now for the most part, the main form of this character is complete, and a lot of what I'll be talking about moving forward is going to be creating details. A lot of different stuff going on with the pins, buttons, and texture on this character. A lot of super fun stuff. But before we get really deep into that, I need to create the cats, or ghost cats I should say, that are floating and hanging around with old Jackie here.
Each of the three ghost cats is unique, however, it's a good idea for me to create a base that I can repurpose for all three of them, rather than create all three from scratch. This saves me a lot of time for the early part of creating the primary forms for these, so I can go ahead and start creating the body, head, ears, and arms, as well as sculpting on some little forms for the paws there, or toe beans as some like to call them. Ghost beans in this case? I'm. I'm not really quite sure. Either way, we're now starting to create the face here using some masks and extractions. I'll be using these forms to create more Boolean operations, much like what I did with the pumpkin head in the very beginning of our process. After getting all three of those cats into the basic position, in terms of making any changes, I just need to get them uh, twisted, spun around, and stretched out to the correct orientation to make sure that the cats are enveloping the character uh, and making sure that those are working from our side view and back, etc. Just like our backpack, shoes, etc. Once we create those objects, we are 3D artists. It can't just look good from the front. We gotta spend the time to make sure it looks good from every possible angle. And then to finish up on the cats, just some small adjustments to uh, make each one unique, matching the reference and making sure those are nice and as clean as possible. Now sit back, relax, and join me on a small journey to Detail City as I go through just about everything on this character and start to push it to the next level. Here, starting off with the pumpkin head, going in with a host of different brushes to mostly rough up my surface, add some nice detail around these different areas that uh, can use it specifically around these areas of the eyes, nose, and mouth, or maybe lack thereof since it's carved in. You can actually see that I've created an illusion of depth using that Boolean feature, as well as now starting to get in some of that surface noise, not only using my brushes, but also using features like clay polish for those that are familiar to create some nice free organic forms. Our hat was feeling just a little too pristine, so I went in, started with a base layer of texture, then sculpted over top of that, creating some nice uh, tears and rips here, specifically around this portion of the edge of the hat, as well as in a few different areas. It's absolutely fine to start with something that is an automatically applied surface noise or texture, but after the fact, you do have to go in and start making that feel a little more hand-touched. Typically, in my experience, when you start using these automatic tools, it becomes very obvious when you have especially something that's repetitive like a, a surface texture or anything like that. So if you are using some of that, make sure you go in after the fact and put a little hand-touched magic on top. Same thing here with the hand, starting to get that nice wooden striation texture going on, very similar to the neck and chest as well as taking the time to make sure that the fingers are gripping our wand nice and tightly. As much as I love making details, I still need to make sure that everything's interacting in a very believable way. And now for something that, at least in my opinion, could exist on some oddly satisfying forum somewhere, uh, anytime you watch the recreation of some seam lines like this. There's just something about it, watching it all kind of come together in a nice, clean edge. I'm a big fan of it. I don't know, there's something about it, just watching it all kind of gently flow and come together that is very satisfying. I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head what this portion of the jacket is called, maybe the hem? But this bottom portion here I'm going through uh, by hand creating some secondary forms starting to create these separative areas, beginning with a move brush with a low focal shift, any old carving brush, and then going over top of that with my custom clay brush. Finishing up by smoothing and then creating that nice edge, and then getting some sharper transitions in just a few areas here. And then I go up to the collar and give it the exact same treatment.
I'm actually very happy with the solution that I found for the tears in the shirt. A lot of the time, torn fabric can be pretty hard to reproduce in ZBrush. What I've done here is I've created a one-sided piece of geometry for the shirt, put some holes into the surface as you can see, applied some rough texture, and then what I'm doing is inserting some small tubes of geometry to hint at some stitching or more tears in the fabric. Then moving on to applying the buttons to our shirt, using an insert multi-mesh brush to insert some quick cylinders, then going over top of those with the Z Modeler brush to create some bevels, some creases, and give those some nice secondary forms overall. And then quickly going over to the other side of the jacket, just sculpting by hand using my own custom sharp soft brush to create the illusion of depth and make it look like a button might be able to fit inside of there. And now returning to the backpack to add some texture, some smaller details, as well as our stickers and pins. You know, now that I look at it, a lot of this footage is me sculpting this backpack. Maybe I should have titled this video, How to Make a Backpack. Hmm. Now I know what you're thinking. Those are some nice looking straps. Thank you, thank you. They took way too long to make and uh, had many mistakes along the way, but hey, it was a learning experience or that's what I'm gonna tell myself to make myself feel better. Okay, now one of my favorite parts, creating the stickers and pins that are going to be on the backpack as well as the front on the straps. For these, I could of course just use some paint and some textures or something like that, but hey, that's no fun. So I created some actual three-dimensional geometry. I cut out these shapes from the backside of this bag and then repurposed that geometry to create that ghost that you just saw fly by really quick as well as a couple bats. And then finally, this last sticker that's coming up here for the all-seeing eye. It kind of reminds me of the Eye of Truth from The Legend of Zelda. And now this one is actually a pin, not a sticker. I'm not sure if all of them are supposed to be pins. It doesn't really matter. I created all of them the exact same way. Here we have a beautiful pumpkin coming together rather quickly here. Just adding some paint on top of that, as well as getting a stem, something that's going to allow it to hang from one of these zippers, get that into position, and then we can move on to our last two pins. This was my favorite one to create. It had a little more organic form going on than a few of the others. So I could play around with this one, create a quick skull pin. I would put one of these on my backpack if I had a backpack and if I was cool and wow, I need to go rethink a few things. Okay, for this one, I'm gonna be honest, this one's way too complicated for me to show off the whole process for, but essentially I took that nice JPEG, I converted that JPEG into a vector, and then I converted that vector into 3D geometry. That is the Sparknotes version, if you will, for those that know what Sparknotes is. And look at that, it's all coming together here at the end. We've created pretty much everything we need. The last few details here are going to be in this ghostly ectoplasm, I guess, is what I'm going to call it. I don't, I don't really think I like that word now that I say it out loud. Either way, I'm going to create a lot of little details of this purplish stuff going on around the wand and all the cats, as well as spend a little time here at the end just cleaning up those cats, making sure that they're feeling a little better, uh, a little nicer, a little more appealing.
I'm gonna be honest, the hardest part about these cats were the faces. The faces are very flat in the 2D illustration, but in 3D, they, they just don't really work that way. They don't work super well from the profile. From the front, they're okay, but if I'm gonna be completely honest, I could have spent a lot more time on them, but hey, this is what you get this time around. I'm sorry, maybe I'll make some better ghost cats in the next character. We'll see, don't hold your breath. And now for the part that so many skip to, the final renders. Hello my skipping friends, so glad to see you, but hey, if you like what you see, I think you'll also really enjoy learning more about the process of how I made this character. And if you'd like to learn some more about that, consider going back, checking out some of the video, or checking out the links down in the description for some more detailed looks at my creative process. Yeah, 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 I know I caught you skipping, no big deal. Either way, I appreciate you checking out my art. Check out the links below in the description. My Gumroad is where you can find all of my tutorials and custom brushes. And the Appeal Academy is my big course that includes an ever-expanding massive library of videos on everything I know about creating appealing characters, which I think is quite a lot. And if you're not ready for that yet, I recommend checking out my Patreon. If you are new around here, click that subscribe button, and if you enjoyed this video, please click that like button. It helps out a lot. It lets me know that you guys are enjoying the videos. I spend a lot of time not just making these characters, but also putting these videos together. So drop a quick like and hit subscribe if you haven't. I appreciate you so much. Thank you for watching. Happy Halloween, and I will see you in the next video.